Conti Martin was in New York when her husband called from Washington. I feel a pain I've never felt, he told her from the ambulance. Ambassador Richard Holbrook had collapsed in Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's office. He died soon after. In dealing with her grief, Conti decided to go to Paris, where they had first started their romance. She writes about her life with Richard Holbrook, as well as her 15-year marriage to newsman Peter Jennings, in a memoir. It's called Paris, A Love Story. Cotty Martin is an award-winning author and journalist, and she joins me in the studio. Cotty, welcome to the program. Thanks, Vimi. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. You said that it seemed, after Richard had died, that he had disappeared. What do you mean by that? Well, it was just so sudden. I mean, he, he wasn't sick. There was absolutely no warning, no preparation. As, as, you, as you said, an hour before uh, he, he collapsed, we were, we were on the phone. Um, and an hour before that, he, um, we were planning our Christmas vacation. This was a year and a half ago. And um, Richard, you know, a lot of cliches have been attached to, to Richard Holbrook. Uh, hard driving, larger than life. Bulldozer. Uh, bull- yes, <laughs> among others. <laughs> um, and uh, there never was a more vital human being. He was very robust. It is true that um, he had one of the most stressful jobs in, in the government. He, he was in charge of um, Pakistan and Afghanistan for President Obama, and, and that he was traveling to some pretty awful places and uh, keeping hours that, uh, that a man half his age shouldn't keep. But no indication that he, had, that he was sick, no, he no, wasn't none. in any pain? None, none, uh, none whatsoever, which is, of course, a, a great blessing for him, but the shock for me, was, was, was total. I uh, really uh, was shattered. Uh, we'd been together for 17 years, and uh, I write in, um, in the book that, uh, that the year prior, I'd had these, these I'm, I'm Hungarian and therefore superstitious, and I had, I had these, these dreams that, that, um, that I was going to be struck down for my good fortune, that things were going too well, that, you know, the gods will punish you if you're too happy. And things were going well for us. Richard was granted he had a very tough job, but it was work he loved. And uh, our kids were doing well. And I had just written uh, my family's uh, memoir, uh, Enemies of the People, which had you know beautiful reviews. And, you know, things were going so well. And when these late night fears circled. I, uh, my, my first thought was to my children because Richard was indestructible. He would always be there to pick up the pieces. Connie, what was his condition when you got to the hospital? Well, um, he, was, he was already um, uh, being operated on by this amazing team at uh, GW Hospital here. That, uh, ironically, it was a Pakistani surgeon who was operating on him, and he, and he seemed to be extremely aware of who he was operating on. And, you know, a man who was trying to bring Pakistan back from the brink for 21 hours they operated on. Richard never regained um, consciousness. So Even, our, last, our last words were, in, were, were when he called from the ambulance, which you just cited, and my last words to my husband were, I'm on my way. Before being sedated for surgery, he, mm. he joked with his doctors. Yes, typically. <laughs> he said, see yeah. what you can do about, uh, you know, ending this war dead. while I'm yeah. over in there. Right, right. Yes. I mean, it's so typical. The, the, I, I subsequently learned from, uh, of course, I was very interested in his, in his last words, and, and I subsequently learned from the, from the nurses and doctors that, that uh, one of the doctors had said to him, um, when they were trying to sedate him, uh, uh, no easy matter with Richard Holbrook, uh, think about something beautiful. And he said, my wife, Kati. Mm. And um, yeah, it's hard. He, he, Richard Holbrook will always be remembered for his role in ending the hostilities in Bosnia with the Dayton yes. Peace Accords. President Obama, as you said, um, assigned him to be special envoy to Pakistan and Afghanistan. Was he frustrated, Kati, with the lack of progress there? Oh, sure. Yes, absolutely. He was dealing with, uh, with, with the most impossible allies, if one can call them that, uh, imaginable, tougher than, than, uh, than bringing peace to, uh, to Bosnia because— He recognized that. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I mean, there, there were just so many— um, dimensions to this problem and so many so many layers and and so many um 
countries involved. And, and when you're dealing with your allies, as Afghanistan and Pakistan are, nominally are, are allies, you can't threaten with bombs, as, as Richard effectively, whilst conducting diplomacy in, right. uh, with, with uh, Mil- Slobodan Milosevic, the president of Serbia, he could threaten an airstrike. Yes, and and did and and it 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 did bring them to the table. But here, no, um, and and you're dealing with with um, a nuclear powered Pakistan, uh, which is also uh, providing sanctuary to um, to the Taliban, and uh, the consequences uh, could not have been of greater import, which is what appealed to Richard. Richard liked to be in a place of maximum complexity, um, solving that, that, problems. That, that That's motivated him. That's who he was. He was a problem solver. You know, Pakistani President Zardari had traveled to Washington to be at uh, Richard Holbrook's memorial service. And he told you about his grief after his wife, Benazir Bhutto, yes. was assassinated. That was very touching, actually. He, first of all, that, that he would come all this way. Um, to the Kennedy Center Memorial, and then he insisted on seeing me, and he said, um, he said, you know, Kati, um, you have to let yourself um, feel the grief, and you have to allow yourself that, that pain. It was suddenly, it wasn't a head of state talking to, to a, a widow, it was a widower talking to a widow, and he said, he said, Benazir's things are as she left them. Uh, her beads are on the on, on her dressing table. Her saris hang in the closet. Um, it's, this was three years later. Yes, yes. Uh, so I was very, very, very touched by that. It was it was uh, very emotional. Cotty Martin is the author of seven books. She's an award winning former NPR and ABC News correspondent. She was married to the late diplomat Richard Holbrook, and her memoir is called Paris: A Love Story. Your family fled Hungary when you were a child. What were the circumstances? Well, uh, I had a very dramatic childhood. I, I, I kind of felt that I, you know, earned my, uh, you know, put in put in my drama early on, so that I was going to get a free ride the rest of the way. But uh, you were not so lucky. <laughs> that was that was not the. But but I, I want to say, Mimi, to to, uh, to you know this because you've read the book that this really isn't a book about grief. It's really about getting past grief to, as much as President Zardari um, hasn't moved anything that Benazir left, I've chosen a different path uh, in, in, in my, Richard is with me and will be forever. But uh, Richard would not want me to be uh, paralyzed by grief. And, and so this book is really about uh, going from loss to life, because none of us, as I learned bitterly, none of us escapes loss. Sooner or later, uh, a, a, a harsh blow will find all of us. And maybe because you just asked about my early years and, and the circumstances of my leaving Budapest, maybe because I went through something tough as a little kid. Uh, that is to say, both my parents were arrested uh, when I was six years old and in during Cold War um, the Cold War period in, in Budapest, Hungary, where, where I was born and raised. And, and I, in my mother's case, I opened the door to her jailers, and, and I didn't see her for a year. And my father had already been arrested, and I didn't see him for two years. So maybe I have a survival gene from that period, which was, which was a very tough period because, because we, my sister and I, uh, did not know where our parents were or how long Right. When uh, they would come back. We'd be separated from them. So I'm not, I, I don't like separations very much. <laughs> I don't do too well with separations. You eventually, after coming to the United States, you went back to Europe as yes. a foreign correspondent for ABC News. Yes. That was 1978. And there you met Peter Jess. Yes. The... And let's just say you two hit it off. <laughs> yeah. Well, not right away. We were mutually unimpressed by our first meeting. It's kind of a scene from Pride and Prejudice, you know, when, when Mr. Darcy meets Elizabeth. <laughs> I thought he was a That's jerk. That's true. Actually. It was just like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. We were not impressed by each other. He thought I, he overheard me making plans. Uh, this was my first week as foreign correspondent. Of course, Peter Jennings was by then, uh, you know, superstar. James Bond, he was called Peter of Arabia. He was inc- unbelievably good looking. And of course, 
even even when I thought what a jerk, I thought, wow, he's so good looking too. But uh, we didn't we didn't our our, our mutual uh, hostility at first meeting did not last very long. Now you said this in your book, quote. From the earliest days, the strains of a love affair between two emotionally needy and ambitious people were apparent. What did you mean by that? Well, just that. You know, this is an honest book. This is not a, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't varnish uh, who I am or who Richard was or who Peter was. Though these are public men, they are human beings, first of all, made of the same human stuff as the rest of us. Obviously, I am all too human. And, uh, you know, we, we, um, we are none of us paragons of perfection, I, and, and that is not how I portray them. I hope you agree that I portray both, both Richard and Peter with, with great ref- respect and, and, and great love, actually, because so, Peter, Peter became the father of my children. So, you know, wh- that's a relationship that, that, um, that is lifelong. But you loved your job at ABC mm-hmm. News. Why did you quit after you married Peter? Um, Peter was a, a, a sort of a male chauvinist. He didn't. He although when he met me, I was already an ABC correspondent. He really wanted his wife to to be primarily focused on him and uh, not to be traveling all over the place. And in those days, ABC wasn't too excited about having a married couple in the same news division either. So I I decided that I would. Um, as, uh, after after our the, the birth of our first child, Elizabeth, I decided that I'd try my hand at writing. I was on maternity leave, so intending to go back, but really was losing my enthusiasm for going back. And you and, became a great writer. You wrote well, seven books. Thank you. This is the eighth, actually. So, <laughs> You did move to New York mm-hmm. for Peter's job. What yes. impact did that move have on you and your family? Oh, huge, huge. Um, Peter became the, you know, America's number one anchor, and... Uh, but inside our family unit, uh, there was a huge loss of, of privacy and between us, loss of intimacy. The, the, to be the network anchor is a super stressful position. And, and we really lived from, from one ratings to the next. And they were always coming. And uh, tremendous stress and, and virtually no privacy. I mean, the minute we left our apartment, there, the privacy was over. Uh, be, People recognized him. You know, I, I describe in, in the book the, 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 the really, really sad, poignant uh, scene where, where, where uh, many years after, after our marriage, um, we were married for 15 years, but by now the marriage has sadly uh, collapsed. Um, he called, Peter called me uh, and asked me to meet him in Central Park, and he had some devastating news to deliver. He wanted me to be the first to know that he'd been diagnosed with lung cancer. And, uh, of course, I burst out in tears. And, um, uh, and he, you know, he pulled me ever deeper into the park. But everywhere we went, people recognized him. And I said, geez, they, you know, even— They can never let you be. Not for a minute. And, and he just shrugged. That was, that was his life. But it's very hard to, to, to live a, quote, normal life. With, with a person who is that recognized. 